The story starts with a chaotic scene. Heavy rain exposes a battlefield surrounded by bright red roses, like the blood staining the area. A prince walked through this war-torn place, heading toward the crucial point of the invading castle. He easily defeated every enemy in his path until he reached a corridor guarded by four soldiers. Among them, there was a woman disguised as a man, serving in the kingdom's military. The guards were waiting for the bell to toll, signaling that the castle's prince had escaped. However, Emperor Arnold Hain of Galkine arrived before that moment. He was the one who started the war and wouldn't spare the woman and her comrades until he achieved his goal. The Emperor slowly approached the enemy troops, and despite their anxiety, they bravely faced Arnold. However, just as effortlessly as before, he defeated them one by one until only the woman remained. Arnold broke the woman's sword, and in a final attempt, she tried to strike him just as the bell rang. Instead of a sign of hope, the tolling of the bell became the backdrop to the woman's death. Missing her strike, she fell victim to Arnold's blade, her life slipping away. In her last moments, she accepted her life without succumbing to pain, knowing that in her next attempt, she might avoid such suffering. After her essence merged with the infinite ocean of existence, Risham Guard Wurzner found herself facing Prince Dietrich once again. She was pledged to marry him, but he was publicly humiliating her, calling her a schemer undeserving of someone of his class. He annulled the marriage before the crowd, but Rish remained unfazed, accepting her fate calmly. This angered the prince, but Rish had lived through this scene many times before and was no longer affected by baseless insults from a spoiled individual like him. However, she remembered a time when she wasn't as mature. The first time her fiancé broke up with her in front of the kingdom's nobles, she felt embarrassed in front of Prince Dietrich. She was accused of various crimes in front of everyone and banished from the realm forever. On that same night, her parents, who were part of the Wurzner family of dukes sworn to the crown, couldn't forgive their daughter's betrayal. So, in addition to being kicked out of the kingdom, she also had to face rejection from her own family. She wandered aimlessly, with only the clothes on her back, through the dark and lonely night. She walked away from the extravagant wealth of the bourgeoisie, where she had spent her entire life. Eventually, she stumbled upon a group of traveling merchants on their way to the next country for their expedition. The leader of the group was a kind-hearted man who decided to invite the lost girl to travel with his comrades. One of the companions wondered if it was a good idea, as beautiful women like her could be more trouble than the cargo they were used to carrying. Although amused, the leader, Tully, was more intrigued by the girl's silk dress, which shimmered brightly even under the moonlight. With his sharp wit, he deduced that she must be from Viscola, a sign of royalty or nobility. He made a sarcastic comment about how a noble like her shouldn't be on the dirty ground near the castle. Instead of being bothered by the taunt, she regained her composure and offered to sell a precious ring to the merchants. This audacious move brought a spontaneous smile to Tully's face, and soon, Rishi found herself inside the caravan with the merchant. As they sipped sake, they talked about their passion for their work, how they cherished the goods that ignited their hearts and could evoke the same feeling in buyers. It was this deep connection that gave the merchant's name a good reputation and ensured their business made a profit. According to the leader, this was the motto of the area trading company. These stories sparked a fire in young Rishi's eyes. No longer bound to the fate of serving egocentric princes as a luxury servant, she decided to begin a new chapter in her life by joining the traveling traders and becoming a merchant. Under Chief Tully's guidance, she learned all there was to know about trade. She embarked on a journey across the world, driven by her newfound dream of visiting every country. However, just as she was about to check off the last nation on her list, she found herself caught in a war and lost her life. In that moment, her mysterious ability to reset her life transported her back to the exact moment when Prince Dietrich annulled their marriage. This was only the first time she had been reborn. Bewildered, she recognized the same dress and ring she wore on that fateful day. At first, she thought it was a dream. But when she pinched herself and felt the pain, she realized she was facing exile from the kingdom once again. As her fiancé repeated his arrogant speech, she turned away without uttering a word. Even though she didn't understand how, she silently thanked the heavens for this second chance at life and embarked on a new adventure. Her only regret was not being able to carry more resources in her suitcase, which would have accelerated her journey. She attempted to locate Tully and his comrades, but arrived at the same place as in her previous life, only to find that the caravan of the trading company had already departed. Despondent, she rummaged through her belongings hoping to find some sign of destiny that would guide her in this new life. Eventually, she discovered a gift her grandmother had left her long ago, an illustrated book of foreign medicinal plants. Unlike her first life, Rishi now had the means and the time to return to her quarters. She used everything she could sell to cross the sea and study medicine. In her new pursuit, she delved deep into the knowledge of medicinal herbs, combining it with the business acumen she had gained in her previous life on Earth. 
Rishi became a successful healer, sought after to treat members of the high courts in distant realms, including Prince Kyle from a country in the far north. However, just like the first time, she found herself ensnared in another war and lost her life again. Yet, with each rebirth, Rishi's maturity continued to evolve, layer by layer, as she returned once more to the moment of her exile by Diatrich. Rishi, filled with disdain, bids farewell and embarks on her new journey with determination and careful planning. In her second life, she immerses herself in the study of a specialized field and becomes acquainted with a brilliant scholar, Dr. Michael Evans. When they meet, Rishi realizes that she knows Dr. Evans from her previous life. The two scholars collaborate on important research projects, and Rishi gains a fresh perspective on the past through their dedicated work together. With this newfound knowledge, she eventually parts ways with her mentor and continues her research independently. However, once again, her life is cut short by war, marking her third death. In her fourth reincarnation, she serves as a maid in a duke's mansion, and in the sixth, she disguises herself as a man and becomes a knight, participating in numerous battles. Throughout each of her lives, Rishi finds fulfillment and motivation in seeking new experiences and knowledge. However, no matter the circumstances, she consistently faces death every five years, whether by the blade of a sword in a brutal conflict or from the toll of excessive work. Determined to break this cycle and ensure a long and prosperous life, Rishi decides to change her routine. She alters her route from the palace to the street, hoping to change the course of her destiny. Instead of leaving through the main entrance, she opts for a different path that takes her behind the mansion. However, on her way, she encounters a man who sends chills down her spine. It's Emperor Arnold Hine. When she hears his full name and noble title, she finds it odd that he is known in lands he has never visited. To conceal the fact that she has already been killed by this man, she responds by saying that Arnold's reputation precedes him, and some inhabitants of the kingdom are aware of who he is. Despite this, Rishi was unaware that Arnold's father was still alive, which meant that Arnold was only the heir to his lineage, not yet the ruler. She couldn't come up with a convincing excuse quickly enough, so she decides to apologize for the inconvenience and bids farewell to the noble. She takes off her shoes and jumps from the second floor balcony, but luckily, she escapes serious harm from the fall and gets up without major issues. She breaks the heels of her sandals in the process and prepares for a long walk ahead. Arnold, who observed everything, becomes enchanted and curious about this eccentric maiden. He immediately orders a servant to prepare his horse. Meanwhile, Rishi, who is lost on her way, encounters some guards who alert Prince Dietrich about the girl's presence. The heir approaches, feigning importance and claiming that he understands the maiden's discomfort at hearing him condemn her so harshly. But as the future king, he sees it as his duty not to taint his family's lineage with the presence of a deceitful bride like her. Amidst this confrontation, Rishi puts her hand on her head and laments that she has placed herself in one of the worst situations in all her reincarnations. However, this action elicits an expected reaction from the egocentric prince, who interprets it as a sign that the girl has been broken by his decision. And her heart is so wounded that she has lost her sanity, wandering aimlessly through the city streets. This pushes Rishi to her limit, and she responds by calling the prince a fool and stating that sorrow is not something that can stain one's clothes, but rather the path one walks in life. She emphasizes that she is not saddened by the broken engagement. Her serious and direct demeanor leaves the prince in despair, causing his mask to slip as he realizes that Rishi has no consideration for him. This revelation makes those around them notice that it is Diatrich, not Rishi, who is being rebuked. Hearing this, the prince turns to his subjects in a fit of rage, demanding respect. However, Rishi calmly interrupts and reminds him that his role is to uplift the people, not to treat them however he pleases. She goes further, emphasizing that Diatrich is doing her a favor by allowing her not to have to look at his face ever again. Just as she is about to deliver the final blow, a young maiden named Marie intervenes, taking Diatrich's side and telling Rishi to stop bothering the beloved Prince Diatrich. With this, the prince becomes more determined to continue his little show. He points his finger at Rishi and claims that he could never get involved with a woman who disturbs a perfect maiden like Marie. However, Rishi doesn't back down and reaffirms her commitment to fulfilling the annulment agreement. She makes it clear that she will never cross paths with the prince again, but she wants everyone to know that it doesn't bother her at all. She used to think her worth was only tied to the chance of marrying a prince, but life has taught her that true fulfillment comes from her own achievements and efforts. Rishi also mentions that, despite any lies Marie may have told to incriminate her, she holds no anger towards the girl. She understands that Marie schemed all of this to marry the heir to the throne. However, she emphasizes that since this future was not even desired by herself, it holds no meaning for her. She acknowledges that sometimes it's necessary to yield to family wishes, 
but she believes that taking actions on her own is essential to feel complete as an individual. Having achieved her goals, she leaves the room. Dietrich follows her, ordering his guards to apprehend her. In a surprising move, she grabs her ex-fiancé's sword and attacks a man she perceives as a threat right in front of her. This man turns out to be Arnold once again, and he questions where she learned to do such things. The surrounding population is filled with fear and apprehension, as Arnold is known to be capable of decimating entire battalions without assistance. Rishi knows that her sixth reincarnation ended at the hands of this man, and that he will one day cause a world-spanning war, ultimately leading to her death. However, Arnold surprises everyone by dispelling his reputation as an ill omen. He kneels before Rishi and apologizes for his rudeness upon arrival. He asks Rishi for the honor of making her his wife. Arnold really tries to win Risha over, but she quickly says no. The tension is high, but Arnold just starts laughing, which confuses everyone, especially the other guy who likes Risha, Prince Dietrich. The prince is shocked to see his old girlfriend getting a marriage proposal right in front of him. Risha, feeling hurt and angry, wonders how Arnold, who had caused her so much pain, could dare to propose to her. At this moment, the king arrives in his fancy carriage. He's really angry with his son for messing up things with Risha and breaking off their previous engagement in such a mean way. The king thinks Risha should consider Arnold's proposal again. Arnold makes it clear that their past issues shouldn't create problems between their two kingdoms. Then, Arnold asks to talk to Risha alone. The king encourages Risha to hear Arnold out. Alone together, Arnold admits he's deeply in love with her. Risha is skeptical, thinking it's all just a play for power, but she knows she would have jumped at the chance to marry him in the past. But now, Risha has experienced so much more of life and knows there are many other choices. She's hesitant to marry Arnold, especially since he's been involved in wars and seems like a tough person to live with. So, she decides to see how serious Arnold is by making some demands. First, she wants her favorite trade company to handle all the wedding preparations, and Arnold agrees. Then, she asks for a private area to meet with people from other countries, which Arnold also agrees to since it's part of her role. Third, she wants to live separately from the emperor, and Arnold is okay with this too. The biggest thing Risha asks for is the freedom to go wherever she wants in the castle. She also insists that Arnold must not touch her. Arnold thinks these demands are a bit much. In the end, Arnold accepts all her conditions and takes his new fiancé to his kingdom, ready to start their life together under these new terms. On the way, Rishi has her time to develop the skills she acquired in her past lives. However, at a point in the journey, Arnold extends his hand towards Rishi. She reminds the young man that she demanded he not touch her. But he reassures the situation, saying he's just trying to retrieve the sword she slept on. Upon looking at the weapon, the girl wonders how she could have slept on the sword that impaled her previously. Next, Arnold informs her that he has scheduled a meeting with the trade representative Rish indicated, the area company. Since this company has managed to attract many clients around the kingdom, Arnold asks if Rish has done business with this company, but she responds that she only heard that they have good products. Internally, she knows she wants to maintain contact with Aria to develop her trading skills and reconnect with her friends, but she keeps this to herself. Also within her thoughts, Rishi notices the imposing beauty of her fiancé, and as she was looking at him with that admiring expression, he asks what's going on, but the suitor pretends that nothing is happening. At that moment, a group attacks the noble carriage, and Arnold instructs his fiancé to stay inside. Despite their request, Rishi is no tame animal and decides to open the carriage door with the hairpin she was using. Stepping out, she faces the conflict, with men dying in front of her. After the victory of the defense convoy, Arnold is nervous about having to face the enemies personally, so he orders the survivors to be captured. However, despite the battle being violent, Rishi notes that no bandit was eliminated. Unfortunately, one of her fiancé's soldiers was injured and upon examining the sword that hit him, Arnold sees that there is poison in the body of his warrior, and orders his subordinates to tie a band as close to the heart as possible, and then sup the poison out. Sting the sword where she analyzes that the poison was made from carotid grass and indigo mushroom. As the situation is delicate, the leader orders them to return to a hunter's guild, on the way it may have the antidote at hand. But before the return, Rishi takes responsibility for creating an antidote, and with the plants she had on hand, even though they were not as effective as she would like, she improvised enough to try to reverse the effect on the wounded man. Rishi, with the best intentions, is worried that the soldiers might doubt her ability to cure the poison. So, she decides to prove her remedy works by cutting her own arm with the poison sword. Arnold tries to stop her, but she's already made the cut. Calmly, she applies her homemade remedy to her wound and then offers it to the injured soldiers, giving them a choice between her treatment and suffering from the poison for days. The soldiers choose Rishi's remedy. 
While they're being treated, the prince's personal assistant wonders why Arnold needs guards if he can handle problems himself. Arnold explains that he can fight enemies alone, but having kingdom fighters show strength and importance. The assistant then asks Arnold why he's taking Rishi with him. Arnold says it wasn't his idea. Meanwhile, Rishi is out in the field gathering plants. Arnold finds her and asks how she got out of the carriage. Rishi reveals that in a past life, her boss would lock her in, so she learned how to pick locks. Arnold comments on how unpredictable Rishi is and wonders when she'll surprise everyone again with her unique way of doing things. Rishi doesn't appreciate his tone, feeling like he sees her as some kind of exotic animal. She tells him she's never done anything just for his entertainment. Arnold then humbles himself and shares about the night Rishi is helping, who used to live on the streets. He explains that even in a society where merit is valued, people are often judged by their origins. Despite this, he chose to become a warrior and faced many challenges along the way. Even when he was not fully prepared for the mission, he committed himself to training and being ready for this crucial moment. Rishi listens carefully to Arnold's story and realizes he truly values the soldiers who fight alongside him. Arnold appreciates these men and thanks Rishi for helping them, which surprises her. She thought he wasn't the sentimental type. Despite her doubts, she politely responds that she just used her knowledge. However, some of Arnold's warriors are still unsure about her, especially after hearing about her broken engagement with Prince Dietrich. They suspect she might not be trustworthy. Arnold reassures her, explaining that in his family, the Empress is traditionally from a royal family of another country. So, despite the challenges, Rishi should not worry, everything will work out over time. He admits that people in Galkine can be harsh, implying that Rishi might be treated like a hostage due to their customs. This revelation oddly pleases Rishi, as it means she can relax and avoid formal duties. She takes this opportunity to remind Arnold of his promise to hold her hand. They eventually arrive in Galkine, a city renowned for its power and wealth. Rishi has never been to this city in any of her past lives, and she finds the capital bustling and welcoming. At Prince Arnold Hines mansion, they learn that the countryside house they were supposed to stay in is not ready. Rishi is told she'll have to sleep in the guest room, but she insists on staying at the countryside house, regardless of its condition. Arnold objects, saying the place hasn't been used in a long time and is in poor shape. Rishi, determined, says she doesn't mind and reminds Arnold that she's a hostage in this situation, so he should treat her as such. Arnold is puzzled by her amusement with this idea. When they get to the countryside house, Rishi sees it's dirty. She uses her past life experience as a servant to start cleaning, asking the guards just to move the furniture. While cleaning, Rishi remembers a troubling thought. Arnold will eventually kill his father, the Emperor of Galkin, leading to war. She feels a strong need to prevent this, as all her past deaths are linked to war started by Arnold. Rishi resolves to do everything she can to avert the war, hoping for a peaceful and prosperous life without these conflicts. While all this is happening, a scene unfolds with a maid being picked on by others who boast about being the future maids of the crown princess. But then, the princess herself, Rishi, appears and sees the girl on the ground. The mean maids, not recognizing their future boss, keep gossiping. They brag about their three months of experience and are determined not to lose their jobs. Rishi steps in and puts the boastful maids in their place. She advises them not to wash the curtains now as the days are long in spring and there's enough time for things to dry. She warns that it might rain later, which could wet the already dried clothes. The leader of the mean maids questions how Rishi can predict the weather. Rishi explains that the type of clouds and birds flying low indicate rain. Washing big items now could mean extra work later. Despite her advice, the experienced maids, full of pride, ignore Rishi and leave. The mistreated maid introduces herself as Elise and thanks Rishi for standing up for her. Rishi, wanting to help more, offers to wash Elise's dress quickly before the rain because it's a light fabric and will dry fast. Elise is touched by Rishi's kindness and wonders who this helpful girl is. But Rishi keeps her identity a secret urging Elise to wash her clothes soon to avoid the rain. Hours later, Rishi relaxes on her new home's balcony, feeling satisfied that she's now visited every country on her list, something she couldn't do in her previous life as a merchant. While reflecting, she notices Arnold and asks if he always slips away from his duties so easily. Arnold, trying to stay unnoticed, is surprised by Rishi's sharpness. Rishi teases him, saying he picked the wrong wife if he wanted to stay under the radar. She figures out Arnold has been adjusting his presence to see when she would notice him. Then Arnold asks what Rishi is looking at, and she points out a large building. Arnold tells Rishi that the building she's looking at is a library filled with books from all over the world. When she asks about a beautiful tower, he explains that it's the central church with a clock. The bell in the tower rings at specific times to remind everyone of the time passing. Rishi, full of excitement, 
keeps asking about everything she sees from the balcony. She wonders why one street is particularly busy, and Arnold tells her it's the busiest commercial street in the Imperial capital. But Arnold seems a bit overwhelmed by Rishi's constant joy and curiosity. He asks why she's so happy, especially since she was pressured into marrying someone from his country. Rishi shares her love for the city. She had always heard about Galkheim but never visited it. Now that she's here and sees its lively streets, historical buildings, and welcoming people, she finds it amazing. Arnold realizes he has never met anyone like Rishi. He's impressed by her confidence, intelligence, and physical abilities. He remarks that no other noble lady he knows has ever shown such quality. This comment reminds Rishi of her mother, who used to say Rishi, as a duke's daughter, only needed to marry well and have children. Feeling emotional, Rishi speaks up, asserting her independence. She describes herself as an adventurer exploring life's mystery, valuing personal achievements over social status. Arnold agrees with her and promises to support her. As he prepares to leave, Arnold suggests Rishi make another request since he broke his promise not to touch her. This leaves Rishi thoughtful, wondering if Arnold might have ulterior motives she hasn't yet realized. The next day, Rishi wakes up in her fancy room. That's when Oliver, who works for Prince Arnold, comes knocking. He's sorry for disturbing her so early, explaining it was the only chance he had to step away from the prince's busy schedule. Oliver looks surprisingly well despite the prince spending the entire night dealing with issues from his hermity trip. The whole hustle is about their upcoming wedding. Rishu feels guilty for all the trouble, but Oliver quickly reassures her, mentioning that Prince Arnold wasn't planning on getting married until he met her. Rishu gets curious about how long Oliver has been with Arnold, and learning it's been a decade, she probes for the real reason Arnold chose her. Oliver admits he's not sure why, but he's seen genuine joy in Arnold's demeanor around her. Rishu feels like she's just part of the wedding arrangements, but Oliver's laughter at her comment worries her. Then, Oliver gives her a guest list for the next night's big event, featuring important figures like Princess Harriet, Duke Jonal, and Prince Kyle. This detailed glimpse into a day in Rishu's life paints a picture of the complex emotions and political intrigue surrounding her engagement to Prince Arnold. The night before the big event, Deanna, the head maid, is busy getting her team ready. They're all feeling the pressure to perform flawlessly on such a significant occasion. At the same time, Rishi goes to see Arnold, her fiancé, to talk about something important. She's come up with a request for Arnold, something he encouraged her to think about during a previous conversation. Rishi wants to choose her own mates, a wish Arnold immediately grants. However, he soon realizes Rishi doesn't have all the details about the upcoming party. Arnold explains the party's true purpose. It's officially to search for a wife for him, a show for the public. Despite Rishi's role as more of a political pawn than a bride-to-be, she's not offended. Instead, she boldly suggests that Arnold should go ahead and introduce her as his chosen partner at the party. The celebration is extravagant, far beyond what Rishi was expecting, though Arnold assures her it's modest by royal standards. As they mingle with the guests, a father introduces his daughter to Arnold, seizing the chance to share tales of his adventures. This sequence highlights the complex dynamics at play in Rishi and Arnold's relationship, setting the stage for further developments in their story. Arnold dismisses the idea of sharing any significant tales from his travels, focusing instead on his joy over finding Rishi, the woman he wishes to marry. This unexpected announcement stuns everyone, drawing all eyes to Rishi. Despite being the center of attention, Rishi, who has faced public embarrassment during a previous marriage debacle, handles the situation with grace and wins over the guests with her poise. As an outsider unfamiliar with the local nobility, Rishi finds herself in a unique position. Arnold encourages the guests to warmly accept her into their community. Walking through the event with Rishi by his side, Arnold makes a bold statement about his commitment to her, emphasizing his readiness to defend her at any cost. Rishi reflects on Arnold's protective declaration, recalling a time when he was the one who ended her life. She jokingly remarks that Arnold might be the most formidable person there, attributing her comment to their disparity in sword fighting skills rather than any past aggression. Arnold, intrigued by Rishi's challenge, offers to test their skills against each other. Seizing the opportunity, Rishi asks Arnold to personally train her in swordsmanship. Arnold is taken aback by her request, but is secretly impressed by her unconventional approach. Rishi, for her part, aims to master the technique Arnold used against her in their previous encounter, hoping to discover a way to protect herself if the need arises again. As the music plays, Rishi and Arnold share a dance, and Rishi finds herself reflecting on their past life battles. These thoughts prompt her to test Arnold's character, wondering if he still possesses the same authoritative nature or if he's become more tender-hearted. Trying to take the lead in the dance, Rishi shifts the tempo, engaging in a playful battle of moves. 
Arnold, however, matches her step for step, maintaining control while still respecting her space, turning their dance into a harmonious exchange rather than a contest of wills. Rishi is left pondering Arnold's true nature. Is he a devoted lover striving to win her over, or a ruthless killer veiling his true self behind nobility? During these musings, she stumbles, only for Arnold to swiftly catch her, preventing her fall. Their dance, resembling a choreographed battle, earns them applause from the audience, highlighting their seamless partnership. Shortly after, a young woman compliments Rishi's dancing and offers her a glass of wine, which Rishi quickly realizes contains an unexpected kick of red pepper. The woman coyly questions if Rishi finds the wine unsatisfactory. Instead of rejecting it, Rishi boldly takes a drink, maintaining her composure despite the spicy surprise, much to the anticipation of the onlookers. Managing to keep her grace, Rishi thanks the woman for the unique experience. Disappointed by Rishi's poise, the women withdraw from the scene without further ado, leaving Rishi to reflect on the incident with a sense of triumph over the attempted mischief. After the party ends, Rishi Weitzner is still enjoying her wine when Arnold comes over to check on her, noticing the spicy scent. Rishi acts unfazed, saying she couldn't pass up trying such a unique flavor. Arnold, with a hint of warning in his voice, suggests she should stop drinking it. Rishi resists giving up her glass, but Arnold takes it from her hands and finishes the wine himself, telling her she no longer needs to worry about it. He then asks what was on her mind during their dance, sensing her attention was elsewhere. Rishi decides honesty is best, though she avoids mentioning her past life memories of him. Instead, she tells him she was worried about his well-being, specifically his left shoulder's movement, which seemed slower. She keeps to herself that this observation is based on her past life memory, where a similar injury played a role in her demise. Arnold shows Rishi a deep scar that runs down his shoulder, a mark of past battles, dotted with cuts meant to end his life. Rishi, curious about the story behind these scars, gets no answer as Arnold brushes off her question and leaves, saying he feels a chill. The next day, the castle is buzzing with maids hoping to be selected to serve the new princess. Despite their efforts, Diana, the head maid, remains unimpressed, pushing them to perfect even the simplest tasks like folding sheets, hinting that only the best will serve the prince's bride. Amidst the hustle, Rishi steps in to help, unrecognized by Diana, who makes a snide comment about her willingness to work without pay. Diana then announces that assisting with the incoming tablecloths for the country house could improve their chances of selection. Later, Rishi tries to lift the maid's spirits, explaining that mastering these tasks takes time. She inquires about Diana's past, learning from Elsie that Diana once came from a rich family that lost everything due to debts. When the decorations for the country house are complete, Diana can't help but admire the setup, unaware of who's responsible but recognizing it as perfect hospitality for nobility. The moment of truth arrives, and the maids await anxiously to see who Rishi, now revealed as their new mistress, has chosen. With a dramatic entrance, Rishi identifies herself as Rish Earnbard Weitzner and selects Margaret, Elsie, Nicole, and Amelia as her personal maids, leaving Diana and the more experienced maids in shock. Diana can't hide her frustration arguing that their experience was overlooked in favor of the newcomers. Oliver starts by telling Diana off for not showing respect, but Rishi decides to handle the situation herself and ends up firing Diana from her job. Rishi then asks Diana if she was always good at her job from the start or if she had to learn everything like everyone else. Diana admits that it was hard in the beginning because she wasn't quick to learn and the experienced maids wouldn't help her. Despite these challenges, Diana became a top maid though she acknowledges she might have held back others to keep her status. Diana shares her story of coming from a rich family that lost everything, which left her alone and unprotected. This background made her competent, but also led her to block others' growth to stay on top. Diana breaks down in tears, and some of her colleagues defend her to Rishi, saying she's a very skilled maid. Hearing this, Rishi decides not to fire Diana, but instead announces that the country house will turn into a training center for maids, where they will also learn to read and write. Rishi believes that even if they leave, this education will help them in any job. Rishi then surprises everyone by asking Diana to help create the training materials. Despite Diana's earlier disrespect, Rishi shows no hard feelings and asks for her involvement again. Meanwhile, Arnold and Oliver talk about Rishi's actions with the maids. Oliver tells the prince about the situation, hinting he thought Rishi would shake things up. Arnold makes it clear he didn't bring Rishi to their world for the empire's or family's gain, but for reasons beyond that. Rishi and Diana work together to pick out the first set of words for the maids to learn, focusing on things like kitchen tools. They think learning to write about everyday items will show the maids why reading and writing matter so much. Diana finds she likes teaching. Then, Elsie helps Rishi get ready for an event that evening. 
Rishi picks out her favorite dress and asks Elsie to do her hair nicely. Elsie wonders why Rishi is dressing up so much just to meet a new merchant. Rishi says looking good helps make first impressions easier. But Rishi has another plan. She knows the trading company they're meeting is new and eager to make a good impression on Galkine's royal family. Rishi sees this as a chance to learn more about these newcomers and to use her position as a noble to influence them. That evening, Rishi meets with Kane Tully, the leader of the trading company. Rishi is in negotiations with the chief of the area trading company, a man named Kane Tully. While this may seem like their first meeting for Kane, Rishi remembers him as the person who taught her everything about being a merchant six lives ago. Despite his impressive presence, she feels confident, knowing him already. Rishi seeks Kane's help to avoid war and live a long life. She reminds him that Prince Arnold is ordering wedding materials through the area trading company. However, when she asks to see some of Kane's goods, he surprises her by stating he doesn't have anything to sell to her. This leaves Rish a bit shocked, but Kane tries to clarify, explaining that he doesn't have anything that would meet her expectations. Confused, Rish wonders what he means, and Kane senses that she is somehow staking her life on doing business with him. Despite meeting many people in his life, he acknowledges Rish's unique determination. Declining the business offer, he tells Rish once again that he won't do business with her. Despite her attempts to continue the conversation, Kane bids her farewell. Later, as Rish tends to her gardens, she reflects on Kane's advice to become a merchant who can choose her customers and offer unique value that others can. Kane believes in choosing his customers, but unfortunately, Rish couldn't convince him to choose her. However, she realizes she'll need his connections when the area trading company becomes the largest in the world. One of the assigned knights, Camille, questions why Princess Rish, with her royal status, is working on a garden. Rish explains that the prince gave her the land, and she enjoys growing medicinal herbs to make various medicines. This unconventional behavior surprises the knights. Reflecting on her encounter with Kane, Rish wonders if he was just being cautious. Knowing him as a careful man who loves high-stakes gambles, she ponders what she might have missed. A flashback reminds her of Kane suggesting they take a break and enjoy the sights. The realization strikes her, prompting Rish to end her gardening session and retire to her room. Later that night, an employee of Kane wonders why he turned down the crown princess of Galkine. Kane laughs, explaining that accepting her would lead to heavy losses. However, upon returning to their company's location, they are greeted by Rish in disguise, who had just finished winning a drinking game against other area employees. Kane is surprised to find that Rish has defeated all of his men. He compliments her on her pretty hair dye and asks how she got it. Rish chose a more plain color, aware that her pink hair stands out. She offers her secrets for making hair dye in exchange for a chance to do business with his company. However, Kane laughs it off, knowing she has something more valuable. The negotiations begin, with Kane openly stating that he wants Rish to drop the charade of dressing up for her wedding. Rish accepts, understanding that tricks won't work on him. Kane expresses his interest in having Rish as a trading partner rather than just a client. He wants to know the full scope of her plans before offering his help. Despite promising greater profit margins, he asks for every detail of her money-making scheme. Unable to disclose the information, Rish still wants the area trading company as an ally. Kane finds it interesting that she expects him to enter a contract without knowing the details, a situation traders dislike. Rish promises compensation, but Kane sarcastically questions if he should trust her promise of profit. Rish reveals her plan to stop the crown prince from waging war in the next few years, but she can't share all the details yet. Kane grows impatient, emphasizing that results and proof of performance matter most to him. Unexpectedly, Rish finishes Kane's famous motto, surprising him. She proposes thinking of a successful business idea in the capital, and if he deems her trustworthy based on the results, he can reconsider his decision. The room falls silent for a moment before Kane bursts out laughing, liking the idea of earning his acknowledgement through a profitable venture. Rish knew Kane would appreciate the idea of taking a risk. He gives her a week to demonstrate her determination. As the challenge begins, Rish leaves Kane with a mysterious medicine for his employee's hangovers. Kane is unfamiliar with the medicine, but Rish assures him he'll understand its effectiveness once he tries it. Sneaking back to her balcony after a night out, Rish starts sweating upon hearing her prince's voice, commenting on her late night. She questions why he's there, and Prince Arnold explains he heard that the area trading company rejected her. Finding it odd for a simple trader to turn down a future crown princess, Arnold feels it's unreasonable to criticize Rish's actions since he was the one who encouraged her to spend her time freely. Arnold then approaches her slowly, causing Rish to move back until her back is against the door. She widens her eyes as Arnold places his hand on the door. He expresses surprise at seeing her look scared when facing a man alone at night. 
noting that she had never shown much fear before. Rish apologizes for sneaking out alone at night, acknowledging that it's not suitable for someone in her position as Arnold's fiancé. She expresses concern about damaging his reputation, but Arnold is not bothered by that. Instead, he was worried about her safety, surprising Rish. Arnold informs her that he'll accompany her whenever she visits town, catching her off guard once again. As he walks away, reminding her of her freedom, Rish hesitates to ask him to join her in her selfish behavior. However, Arnold insists that he doesn't want her putting herself in danger, even if he has given her the freedom to do as she likes. This unexpected concern from her prince makes Rish blush, realizing how indulgent he is. Arnold acknowledges that trying to restrict her would only result in her quietly slipping out, noting her dyed hair disguise. He believes it's better to give her permission and accompany her. When he laughs, Rish can see that he genuinely enjoys it. Arnold then inquires about what happened with the area trading company. However, Rish deflects by asking if he's hungry. As she prepares soup, she tastes it and gasps, apologizing for being a terrible cook. Arnold, surprisingly, doesn't mind and finds it unusual for a noble lady to cook. Rish, sweating, recalls that in her past lives, meals were just about prioritizing putting food in her stomach. Arnold stands up and starts sipping the soup Rish made. He compliments her, saying it's good, which surprises Rish. She gasps, thinking he might not be able to distinguish between good and bad flavors. However, Arnold senses her disrespectful thoughts. After enjoying dinner, Rish shares details about her gamble with Kane Tully. Arnold simply expresses understanding, and then inquires about the business she plans to start. Despite having numerous ideas, Rish is uncertain about what will be successful since she is unfamiliar with the preferences of the people in the capital. Arnold smiles at her, irritating Rish a bit as she senses his enjoyment. Arnold leaves to attend to his duty, advising Rish not to entertain or listen to his younger brother if approached. When Rish asks for more information, Arnold leaves without providing any details. In her library, Rish studies the basic demographics of the capital, including the male-to-female ratio, population age, and economic development changes. Her routine involves gardening in the morning, checking the maid's teaching materials in the afternoon, and preparing for her wedding daily. Rish acknowledges that this schedule will likely disrupt her sleep for a while. Back in Arnold's office, Oliver reflects on the midnight snack he shared with Rish. Arnold recalls Rish mentioning she was a terrible cook but smiles, acknowledging that the food was surprisingly good. The next morning, Rish feels a bit tired from her late-night research. She discovers someone sleeping in her garden, and the knights advise her to return to her room. However, Rish can't help but notice the rarity of black hair in their country. The boy wakes up and introduces himself as Theodore August Hine, Arnold's younger brother and second in line to the throne. He mentions sending numerous letters expressing his desire to meet her, even though Arnold never replied. Theodore lightens the mood, urging everyone not to be tense and revealing his relation to Arnold. Despite Arnold's advice not to entertain Theodore, Rish politely responds. Theodore expresses surprise at Rish working on the garden alone and shifts to a serious tone, stating his desire to save her from being a hostage in their country. While Rish appreciates the sentiment, she is content with Arnold's consideration. Theodore then playfully bids farewell. As Rish walks through the halls, she reflects on Theodore's introduction as second to the throne and contemplates the unusual statement for someone to make to their older brother's fiancé. Rish decides to inquire about Arnold and Theodore's relationship from the two guards. However, Camille informs her that he can't share such information. Knowing she'll need to address their situation eventually, Rish shifts her focus to negotiations with Chief Tully. She enters a room where Arnold is discussing the use of the kingdom's military forces. Arnold asserts that they will be employed solely for protecting the people and not to cater to the regional lords. The man questions Arnold's decision, emphasizing that the king will disapprove. Unfazed, Arnold dismisses the man, asserting his authority. Rish looks at Arnold with encouragement, silently supporting his stance. Arnold notices her gaze, sighs, and smiles, which surprises Rish. Arnold outlines his plan to send private notices to regional lords, aiming to make protecting the commoners favorable for them in the long run. This approach aligns with the man's interests, and Rish recalls a text mentioning Arndt's policy of investing war indemnities locally for revitalization and employment. In the evening, Rish finds a letter in her room from Arnold, inviting her to the chapel at midnight to confide a secret. Excited, she arrives at the chapel, only to be surprised by the presence of Arnold's brother, Theodore Hine. Theodore is impressed because just by looking at Rich's attitude, he could tell she knew he would be waiting there, not her prince. While nervously playing with his hair, he continues to explain that she knows nothing about his older brother, Arnold. He tells her Arnold thinks nothing of killing people, that's the kind of person he is. However, what Theodore didn't know was that Arnold had caused her death in six different timelines, 
with the last one being pierced directly by his blade. Arnold committed numerous massacres in other countries, conquering every nation in the world. Theodore then reveals Arnold's crimes against humanity not only occurred during wars, he also killed his own mother. This revelation causes Rich to audibly gasp as Theodore emphasizes how terrible his brother's actions were, warning her that one day she might meet the same fate. But Rich's next response catches him off guard. She plainly remarks, is there something wrong with that? She then admits she was fully aware of how wicked Arnold could be and still chose to marry him anyway. She isn't surprised since she predicted one day he'd kill his own father and take the throne. Theodore tries once more to explain to Rich, but she's had enough of the conversation. Believing Arnold should handle the matter, Theodore feels frightened as he hears the approaching footsteps of the crown prince. Arnold's figure appears shadowy as he moves closer. Theodore attempts to retract his earlier statements. He reassures his brother that there was a misunderstanding and what he said isn't his true belief. However, Arnold responds in a stern tone, reminding Theodore that he had instructed him to stay away from Rich. Theodore, visibly shaken, quickly apologizes and grabs his shawl. When Arnold tells Rich it's time to leave, she asks for a moment to speak with Theodore. Arnold dismisses her, which makes her slightly nervous, but she obeys. As they depart, Rich notices Theodore quietly laughing to himself, murmuring something about their relationship being as he expected, calling her sister. Theodore then shifts back to an apologetic tone, promising Arnold he won't say anything unkind to Rich anymore. As he leaves, Theodore expresses happiness at being able to see Arnold up close after such a long time. Arnold reminds Rich that he had also warned her to stay away from his brother, but she explains that since Arnold's name was mentioned, she couldn't ignore it, though she only hoped he would come. Arnold sighs, mentioning that he received a reply from her to a letter he never sent, indicating she would show up there. Feeling it would be foolish to ignore such a message, he came. Rich expresses gratitude for his presence, but then shifts from a positive demeanor to a concerned one. She asks him about the public's perception of him as a cruel person. Arnold calmly acknowledges that it's probably true, citing his actions in the last war where he took many lives. However, Rich counters, stating she's witnessed his kindness and consideration towards the people of their country. Arnold's demeanor changes as he reaches for Rich's neck, warning her that he's been too lenient on her and advising her to discard her naive mindset if she wants to survive. Despite his warning, Rich remains firm, trusting what she's seen firsthand. Arnold questions how she could know, given she's never seen him on the battlefield. Rich replies that the person who has shown her the most care and consideration is him. Arnold dismisses her words, claiming he's merely using her. However, Rich insists that even if that's true, she can't see him as cruel, referring to him as her husband, a statement that deeply affects Arnold. As they lock eyes, he wonders how Rich could possess such determination. Arnold notices something in Rich's eyes, something he's seen before on the battlefield. It's the look of determination, the kind that speaks volumes. Rich's eyes convey to him that she possesses that unwavering resolve. He gently moves his hand to her cheek, acknowledging her as someone who would fight to the end. Arnold recalls the terrifying moments of war when he faced individuals with that same kind of determination. Rich's eyes widen in shock, realizing that there were things that frightened him too. She then confides in him about her dreams of being killed, but when she wakes up, she's relieved to find herself alive. However, she admits to feeling afraid at times, fearing that she might actually be dead and that her current reality is just a dream after death. This revelation shakes her, as she hadn't realized she harbored these feelings. Nevertheless, she's resolved not to run away. Regardless of how her life may end, she's determined to live as his wife, and that's all she desires. Arnold smirks and then pulls Rich close for a surprising kiss filled with love and passion, catching her off guard. Afterward, he affectionately calls her a fool and assures her she doesn't need to strive to be his wife, but simply live as she pleases. The next day, Rich sits alone, still processing the unexpected kiss and wondering about Arnold's words. Elsie approaches and asks if Rich has been able to sleep, noticing how hard she works. Rich reassures her, though she knows she's pushing herself too hard. Elsie admires Rich's painted nails, which Rich plans to propose as merchandise. As she paints Elsie's nails, Rich explains how in the East, people stain their nails with flower dyes, inspiring her to add color to nail-strengthening medicine. She emphasizes the importance of a diet rich in meat and fish for strong nails. Elsie mentions she'll buy some of the medicine, but expresses concern about her limited funds to support her sibling. Rich sympathizes, recognizing the poverty in Elsie's family. Despite this, Rich continues to paint Elsie's nails, offering to paint them with Elsie's favorite color. Elsie hesitates to accept Rich's offer because she doesn't want to take advantage of Rich's kindness. However, when Rich reassures Elsie that seeing her happy would bring joy to herself and assures her that any color would suit her, Elsie becomes emotional. 
Tears well up in her eyes, prompting Rich to wonder if something is wrong. Elsie explains that she's overwhelmed with happiness. Coming from a very poor family, they could never afford fashionable clothes, and their garments were always in poor condition. She expresses gratitude for being Rich's personal handmaiden and receiving such a beautiful gift. Meanwhile, the other maids prepare Rich's nail polish as instructed. Once finished, they admire their sparkling nails. Rich reflects on the many girls like Elsie who suppress their dreams for their family's sake. Later, Rich meets Kane again and presents the newly painted nails to him. She explains that many men visit the capital, so she devised small bottles of nail polish as souvenirs for them to take back to their wives and lovers. Chief Tully praises Rich's initiative and expresses his desire for his company to begin promoting the product immediately. One of his employees shows enthusiasm, but Kane advises caution. He suggests selling the product at a high price for nobles, but Rich disagrees. She asserts her desire to conduct business on her own terms, mentioning Prince Arnold's establishment of a minimum wage three years ago. Kane is surprised to learn that Arnold was the one who put this policy in place but understands its limitations, as it can only help those who manage to find work. Rich agrees and explains that while the nail polish isn't expensive to produce, it will require a lot of workers to make large quantities. She suggests hiring people from the slums on a large scale, causing both Elsie and Camille to gasp as they come from similar backgrounds. Risa then proposes to reveal the secret of making the nail polish only if Kane agrees to her condition. Kane drops the paper and expresses his disappointment. Camille criticizes Kane's disrespectful remarks, but Rixie signals for him to stop. Kane sarcastically replies that if she wants him to engage in acts of charity, she should wait until he quits being a merchant and becomes a clergyman. However, Rixie is serious. She explains that after the war, Galkine implemented many policies for the people's benefit, leading to an increase in average income. Yet, many still do not benefit from these policies unless a method is provided for them. She warns that without such measures, the economy will stagnate, eventually leading to a decline in tax revenue. Therefore, it's in the nation's and Kane's best interest to support her economic plans. She recalls, Kane once told her that first-class merchants could choose their customer but she believes there's something even better, creating customers and opportunities for the people themselves. Kane is surprised and starts laughing. He finds the idea intriguing. Instead of merely selecting his own customers, if they can help the people of the slums earn money, they will naturally become customers themselves. As their numbers grow, merchant sales will also rise. With all the goods offered by the area trading company being of excellent quality, Kane stands to benefit the most from this. As the employees of the area trading company delight in the prospect of increased profits, Rich considers one day giving the people of the slums the means and time to pursue their dreams, as she looks at Elsie, who is visibly shocked. As the crown princess, her goal is to establish businesses that will bring prosperity to the country's people. Kane is pleased but honestly tells Rich that she's too sincere, as he's already planning to exploit her kindness for his own gain. However, Rich anticipated that he might not readily accept her proposal. She had hoped to avoid using her ultimate leverage, but she has no choice. She presents a document that even startles Kane. When one of his employees expresses concern, Kane signals him to stay silent. He wonders how she obtained such information. Rich apologizes, explaining that she had to employ unconventional methods to acquire it. These methods involve her past life, during which Kane's younger sister, Aria Tully, was severely ill. Kane is not surprised by the leak of this information, as he had consulted numerous doctors about her condition. However, when Rich reveals that she has been cultivating plants to create medicine to cure his sister, Kane is stunned. He finds it hard to believe, as Rich is not a doctor. However, she interrupts him, reminding him of the hangover medicine she provided him on the night when she was in disguise. Kane's men recall their terrible hangovers after losing to her in a drinking contest, but after taking her medicine, they felt better immediately. Now they are shocked to learn that she was the one who created it. Kane sighs heavily and covers his head in frustration. He reflects on how he always advised his employees to become merchants who could attract their own customers. Initially, he thought he was testing her to see if she would agree to work with him. But now it seems the tables have turned, and it's about whether she'll work with him. Feeling desperate, Kane offers to give Rich everything he owns in exchange for the medicine for his sister. However, Rich stops him stating she plans to provide him with the method and the medicinal herbs without any conditions. Kane is taken aback by her lack of intention to exploit his sister's condition. Rich explains that she simply wants him to understand that people from the slums also care deeply about their family. Many older siblings sacrifice their own dreams to support their family and ensure their younger siblings' well-being. She admits that her approach might seem clumsy, but she sincerely wants Kane's help. 
Moved by Rich's words, Kane approaches her and kneels down. He acknowledges his past mistakes in prioritizing his own interests over the welfare of the slum dwellers. He expresses regret for his previous arrogance and vows to support Rich's business idea wholeheartedly, acknowledging that it is better than anything he had envisioned. Feeling relieved that everything has been resolved, Rich tries to get up but collapses, prompting her guards to check on her. She requests to see Elsie, and later that night, Oliver visits her room upon learning of her condition. However, they find her missing. Meanwhile, in a tavern, Prince Theodore reveals himself, thanking Elsie and Camille for assisting him in abducting Princess Rich, who lies unconscious in a dark storage area. Nighttime falls over the poor area of the capital city in the kingdom of Galkine. Rich wakes up as Theodore, Elsie, and Camille come into the room where they've been keeping her. Theodore mockingly asks how his older sister is doing, taken by the maid she trusted. Rich nervously asks why he's doing this. Theodore explains he wants attention from their big brother, Arnold, who hasn't been paying him any mind. Now that Arnold is noticing because of Rich, Theodore feels satisfied. He starts laughing crazily. Rich calmly observes that Theodore wants to be closer to Arnold. Theodore stops laughing and asks what she means. He says he's done talking about it and leaves to bother Arnold, telling Rich to enjoy her time. Rich remembers earlier when she was exhausted from staying up late and negotiating with Kane Tully. Elsie and Camille were the first to see Rich and offered to help her. When Rich heard their offers, she immediately suspected Prince Theodore had ordered them to do something to her, surprising both Elsie and Camille. Elsie asked how Rich knew, and Rich explained she figured it out after receiving a letter from Prince Theodore. Rich wondered who else visited her room regularly besides Elsie, who was the only maid from the slums. She knew Camille was also from there, and Prince Theodore had been secretly supporting the poor for years. Camille confirmed that Theodore had ordered them to keep Rich confined but without harming her. Unexpectedly, Rich agreed to be confined as Theodore had ordered, shocking both Camille and Elsie. Later, Theodore and Arnold arrived, with Theodore jokingly saying his brother had come to see him. Theodore laughs because it's been a long time since they talked like this. Then, he becomes serious and tells Arnold that he needs to listen if he wants Rich back. However, Arnold calmly tells him to get to the point. That's when Theodore straightforwardly says he wants to be the new crown prince, and that's the only way he'll return Rich. If Arnold doesn't agree, Rich will be harmed. But Arnold stays silent. Theodore thinks Arnold doesn't seem worried, but he believes Arnold must still care about Rich. Theodore gets angry because he thinks Arnold values Rich and wants to keep her close, unlike how he treats Theodore himself. Theodore confronts Arnold, looking a little sad. He knows this because he's been observing Arnold closely. Now, he just wants Arnold to admit that he's won, that Theodore has outsmarted him this time. If Theodore could accomplish that one thing, his life would be perfect. When Arnold says Theodore's name, Theodore feels a bit happy. But all Arnold wants to know is how Theodore trapped Rich. Theodore says he just locked her in a room. Arnold asks for more details, so Theodore proudly explains that some tough men are guarding her, and she's on an upper floor with no way out through the window. Arnold remarks, oh, so there's a window, huh? Annoyed, Theodore insists that there's no way Rich can escape, and he'll hurt her if Arnold makes him angry. Arnold calls Theodore foolish, and says there's no way for him to win, not even from the moment he thought he had captured Rich. Theodore looks dumbfounded, thinking Arnold is acting strangely. As Theodore gets angrier, Arnold hears footsteps and says, here it comes. The door slams open, and Theodore is shocked to see the Rich standing there, smiling. She tells him she's here to settle things, and Theodore is shaken. He mutters, this is impossible. Arnold heard that she was held in a room like a prison and wonders if she escaped through the window or punched a hole through the wall, saying this with an amused expression. She answers, feeling a bit teased, that she went through the door like a normal person. Arnold teases her further, asking if it's normal to go through a locked door watched by guards. Theodore asks if someone betrayed him, but Rich only says his name and seriously tells him she has advice for him. She steps forward and advises Theodore on capturing a prisoner. She says never to take eyes off them, always have at least two guards in the room. Rich had picked the lock, had a weapon, and quickly took down the guards. Theodore is shocked. Rich's second advice is to thoroughly search a prisoner. Searching until their nude is most effective for finding escape tools. She demonstrates by leaping down the stairs and dealing with guards. Third, she says to shackle the prisoner's hands behind their back or tie them to a pillar. She faces more guards, leaping behind them and using her daggers. She tells Theodore that simply tying a prisoner up is too lenient. It's better to break their arms and legs, restrain them, and take everything while guards watch. With a serious look, Rich explains that's what it means to take someone prisoner. Theodore's eyes widen. He gasps, seeing how fierce Rich is. When Arnold grabs her shoulders, she softly gasps, blushing as he teases her. He puts his jacket on her, 
and she insists she's fine and concerned for his next scar getting exposed. The sight surprises Theodore. He wonders where his scar came from. Then, sadness fills Theodore's eyes as he feels he's not good enough. Rich asks Theodore's goal in all this. He tries to hide his insecurity, saying he wants the throne. Rich doesn't believe him, thinking he wants to give up his place in the line of succession. Theodore denies it, but Rich continues. At first, she didn't know why he targeted her. Theodore interrupts, saying he wants to make his brother suffer. If Arnold couldn't protect his fiancé, his reputation would be ruined. But Rich doesn't believe this. As a hostage fiancé from another nation, her position is insignificant compared to Arnold's. She senses Theodore intended to disgrace himself as a criminal. She mentions Theodore's pause in public work in the slums, to which he claims he grew tired of charity. Rich knows it's a lie because he's still sending money there, likely his own. She concludes he cares more for the slums than his royal duties. Theodore denies this, insisting he just wants to beat his brother. Rich disagrees, saying if that were true, he'd attack Arnold directly. She believes everything Theodore does is for Arnold's sake, but he vehemently denies it. Theodore repeats, saying she is wrong desperately. He wants Arnold to hate him or even kill him if he won't accept him. Arnold interrupts, reminding Rich not to interact with Theodore. She tries to express Theodore's love for his brother, but Arnold coldly says he doesn't care. Theodore looks shattered. Arnold states Theodore's desires have nothing to do with him. Under his breath, Theodore admits he knew all along. Under his breath, Theodore admits he knew all along. He rushes out of the room, and Arnold tells Rich to leave him be. She asks why Arnold is distancing himself from Theodore intentionally. Arnold refuses to answer. Rich brings up Arnold's words about her not needing to resolve to be his wife. She's been trying to understand his meaning. She believes Arnold wants a future where he can abandon everything, something Theodore probably understands. That's why Theodore is afraid and pretends to be the second prince, though he doesn't want the throne. Rich thinks there must be another way. She begs Arnold to share his thoughts. The room falls silent as Arnold considers his response. He sighs, and Rich feels relieved, thinking she'll finally understand him. But she becomes nervous when she sees his vicious gaze, the same as the night he killed her. He confirms something, and Rich steps back, frightened. He tells her she's adorable with that same intense look. He says she can't understand his intentions, leaving her confused. He insists it's better she doesn't understand his heart. He tells her again to leave Theodore alone and remarks that Theodore should never have involved himself with someone like him. Rich's face lights up as she confirms that Arnold truly loves his brother. She believes if he didn't, he wouldn't have said such things. She asks Arnold if he ever thought about a different future where he didn't disappear, urging him to live without regret. Walking up to Arnold, she declares her intention to live as his wife without regrets, then leaves. Exhausted from all that's happened, she barely holds herself together. Theodore looks up at the sky, remembering his time on the battlefield tending to the wounded. Suddenly, they heard their camp was under attack. Enemies threatened the injured soldiers, and Theodore prepared to sacrifice himself. But when he opened his eyes, he saw his brother had defeated the enemies. Arnold scolded Theodore for risking his life, saying an imperial family member shouldn't do that. However, he praised Theodore for protecting his vassals, which made Theodore happy. Rich appears behind Theodore, and he jokes, asking if she's going to lecture him on escaping now. He smiles and tells her that Arnold keeps his achievements hidden but allows his reputation to spread to other countries. Rich knows Arnold does this on purpose, and she was correct. Theodore knew all along that his brother was acting in a way that could lead to him disappearing. It saddens Theodore to think that such a great person as his brother would leave them. To Theodore, this doesn't seem right. He believes if Arnold plans to vanish and leave the Empire to him, then Theodore should disappear first. With a sad smile, he tells Rich it's the only way he can help his brother. Rich knows Arnold might be planning something like that, but she intends to use everything to stop him, even if she needs help from others, including Theodore. This surprises him. He doubts he'll ever be useful enough to help her, but Rich disagrees. That isn't true. Theodore is Arnold's only little brother. It's something Theodore wants to accept, but his insecurities tell him otherwise. He's always wanted to help his big brother. He's grateful to Rich for saying she needs him, even though it's unexpected. But he's decided how he can be most useful, something he should have done long ago. He sits on the ledge and starts to descend backward. Rich tries to stop him but lacks the strength. As Theodore gazes at the stars, he closes his eyes, ready to accept his fate, only for Arnold's hand to grab him. Arnold pulls him up and slaps him. Rich is stunned as Arnold asks Theodore what he was thinking. Despite Theodore's attempts to justify himself, Arnold points out he's never acted like a big brother to Theodore. Why would Theodore risk his life for someone like him? Rich tells Arnold that even though Theodore is going about it the wrong way, his desire to support Arnold is still right. 
Theodore admits he wishes for the same thing over and over, to be useful to Arnold, his only big brother and role model. Arnold tells Theodore never to do something so foolish again, echoing the way he protected Theodore during the war. Theodore is touched that Arnold remembers that moment. With Arnold's confirmation, Theodore apologizes to his brother and sister, tears welling up in his eyes. Arnold comforts Theodore, telling him he understands and to stop crying. Rich smiles at the touching moment. Arnold then goes to Rich. She expresses her relief that they've patched things up. But suddenly, her vision blurs and Arnold catches her. Theodore worries, thinking it's his fault. However, Arnold reassures him she's just sleeping. Theodore is surprised she can sleep after everything. He admires how beautiful his brother and sister-in-law look together. Arnold lifts Rich and tells Theodore to call the carriage, leaving Theodore stunned by his brother's affection. Hearing Arnold entrust him with escorting Rich home makes Theodore happy, bringing a joyful end to the eventful night. Rich wakes to find Arnold by her side. She apologizes for sleeping, and he's glad she's okay, handing her a letter. It's from Theodore. He apologizes for his actions and promises to help her stop Arnold's plans. He offers her the support of his people in the slums, calling it a common front. He ends with gratitude thanking her. Rich asks Arnold if he spoke to his brother after she fainted, but he just wants to know why she's smiling. She explains she's happy. As Arnold continues working, he tells her to think of something she wants. He broke his promise not to touch her, after all. She blushes, recalling when Arnold kissed her passionately, and hides in the sheets, saying she doesn't need anything. She wants to know why he did it, but when he asks if she wants to know, she gets more embarrassed and says she doesn't. He looks at her and thanks her for looking after his little brother. At first, she gasps, then warmly replies that it's no problem. Next day, in Theodore's office, Rich thanks him for making sure that Camille and Elsie won't get punished for catching her, but he says it's not necessary to thank him. Rich has heard that the plans for improving the slums are going well because of Theodore's leadership. This idea was suggested by his brother Arnold, which makes Theodore feel a bit embarrassed yet proud because he'll be attending important meetings with his older brother, whom he greatly admires. He wonders if Rich came to his office just to tease him about this, but she actually has a favor to ask, which might cause some trouble for him. Meanwhile, Arnold is in his office opening a letter from the Kingdom of Kaelith and sign, likely because of its contents. Then Richie enters, and Arnold notices that she seems nervous. She takes a deep breath and tells him that a room has been prepared for him at the villa. Arnold is puzzled about why this task would make her so nervous. It turns out that Rich's maids have been working hard to prepare the room perfectly, treating it like a very important test of their abilities. Arnold remembers that Rich initially wanted them to live in separate places, but now she's changed her mind. She wants to live with him in the same place. Arnold playfully acknowledges her decision, suggesting she's up to some mischief again. Rich is surprised by Arnold's response, unsure of what he means. Arnold, with a mischievous grin, accepts his fate in Rich's usual schemes, finding her presence uplifting. Oliver, observing the interaction, thanks Rich for distracting Arnold from his usual task. Arnold reflects on how impressive the room is, considering the villa had been abandoned for three years before Rich arrived. He admires how Rich has managed to fix it up in just three months. He's pleased that Rich took the time to train the inexperienced maids, knowing they've gained valuable skills and a sense of accomplishment under her guidance. Arnold warmly compliments Rich for her ability to uplift others, which leaves her completely surprised. He notices her stunned expression and realizes it's unusual for her to receive such praise. Rich, however, initially thinks Arnold is teasing her as usual, but he assures her that he genuinely means it. Even if she suspects it might be insincere, she feels happy to receive a compliment from him. Rich then opens the balcony doors to show off the beautiful view from the room, suggesting it would be perfect for a relaxing nap in the breeze. Arnold jokingly remarks that the best part of being in this room is being close to Richie. He knows this means he'll hear about any of her mischievous escapades sooner rather than later. Rich, with a playful smile, reminds Arnold that her plan is to spend her time lounging around, claiming she won't be getting into any trouble, though she adds, almost under her breath, well, not much anyway. She then brings up Arnold's promise to spar with her, which he made during their engagement announcement ball. Rich is excited about the opportunity, as she believes she can quickly learn the special training methods used by the Knights of Galkine with just one session. Arnold questions Rich about what makes her believe that the techniques of the Imperial Knights are special. Rich explains that since she arrived at the palace, she has observed the training of many soldiers, but the movements and striking style of the Imperial Knights stand out as superior. Arnold agrees, reminding Rich of his promise to support her in any way as her future husband. Rich expresses her joy, claiming that Arnold's swordsmanship is the most beautiful and powerful in the world. With a quiet smile, Arnold responds that it's a grand claim. 
Rich clarifies that it's just an expression, not a literal statement. However, Arnold holds the belief that a skill designed solely for taking lives cannot be considered beautiful. Arnold shifts the conversation, asking Rich what she finds beautiful. The couple assumes their stances, and Arnold begins to instruct Rich, emphasizing the difficulty of breaking incorrect habits once they're formed. Meanwhile, the knights watch nervously as the couple prepares for their duel. Arnold uses specific equipment, such as bolt and arm and leg restraints, to simulate realistic battlefield conditions. This helps him train to continue fighting even if he were to sustain serious injury. Rich is amazed to see Arnold with a blindfold covering one eye, making him look quite handsome. Arnold explains that even if he loses an arm, he'll keep fighting. Even with a broken leg, he'll keep moving forward. And even if he loses both eyes, he'll find a way to defeat his enemy. This determination to survive in battle ensures his victory. Rich has heard that a knight's path seeks both nobility and beauty, and surviving to defeat the enemy is part of that. She understands this is why she couldn't defeat him before. In their previous duel, Rich realizes she made the mistake of risking her life too soon. Arnold reassures her that he has no intention of harming his future wife, especially as they prepare for their wedding. This surprises Rich, but she suggests a wager. If she wins the duel, Arnold must answer any question she asks, and if she loses, she'll grant him one wish. Arnold agrees to the bet, ready to face the challenge. As the match begins, they both adopt defensive positions. Rich knows that the longer the fight lasts, the more it favors Arnold. Gathering her courage, she launches a frontal attack, but Arnold easily deflects it. Arnold encourages Rich to attack him, but she feels her balance is off. She adjusts herself and moves in closer to strike, but Arnold easily avoids her attacks and criticizes her for relying too much on strength. He advises her to use her agility instead. Despite being struck by Arnold's blows, Rich is impressed by his ability to pinpoint exactly what she needs to improve on. The other knights watching the spar are also impressed by Rich's progress. As the duel continues, Arnold assumes a stance that reminds Rich of a previous attack that caught her off guard. She manages to dodge it, surprising Arnold. Rich anticipates his next move, but struggles to keep up with her body's reactions. Arnold points out that Rich once claimed his swordplay was the most powerful in the world, but her movements suggest she knows someone even stronger. He becomes envious at the thought. Rich reassures Arnold that he is indeed the strongest, especially considering he will only become stronger in the next five years. Arnold's strength is described as cruel, overwhelming, and formidable. Rich braces herself once more as she and Arnold clash blades, moving in a graceful dance-like manner. She manages to deflect Arnold's strike, reminiscent of a fairy knight's move, but Arnold swiftly disarms her. Exhausted from their exchange, Rich collapses to the ground. As Arnold frees himself from the bindings, he admits he was impressed because he hadn't planned to move at all during their duel. He reminds Rich of their agreement, she must agree to do one thing he asks. He proposes they go out together in town two days from now. However, he notices Rich isn't getting up. Nervously, Rich tries to tell Arnold to go ahead without her, explaining that her arms and legs are still shaking from their duel. She's feeling drained and needs to rest. After a moment of thought, Arnold decides to pick her up, causing Rich to blush in protest. She squirms and kicks as he carries her, feeling embarrassed. As they continue walking, Arnold asks what she would have wanted to know about him if she had won. Realizing Arnold is enjoying her reactions, Rich answers his question. She learns his birthday is December 28th, and that he doesn't have any specific interests or hobbies. All the while, she's being carried away by Arnold. The following day, Rich heads out and discovers that Arnold is moving his office to a new room in the villa. Curious about her prince's whereabouts, she asks Oliver, who explains that Arnold had to take command of the Night Watch unexpectedly last night and hasn't slept yet. Though Oliver suggests Arnold take a nap, Arnold chooses to continue his duties without rest. Concerned for his well-being, Rich heads to Arnold's office and insists that he should rest. However, Arnold argues that resting during the day is futile since he can sense the bustling activity throughout the palace. Undeterred, Rich takes it upon herself to help Arnold relax, vowing to soothe him to sleep. In his new room, Rich tucks Arnold into bed, deciding to stay by his side until he drifts off. Arnold sighs in disbelief at Rich's words, finding them nonsensical. Nevertheless, Rich explains that her presence will prevent him from being distracted by other disturbances. Arnold closes his eyes, attempting to rest, while Rich watches over him quietly. However, noticing Arnold's steady breathing, Rich realizes her efforts aren't effective. She then asks if she can lie down beside him. Arnold agrees with a smile and Rich gently pats his back, mimicking the rhythmic beat of a heartbeat, known to calm the heart and mind. As she gazes at him, memories flood back of her time as a mate, comforting her lady in a similar manner. Rich shares with Arnold that this technique often lulls young children to sleep quickly. 
Arnold smiles warmly because Rich is the only person who would treat him with such care and familiarity. As he rests, Rich continues to gaze at her prince, gently patting him on the chest. She gazes at his scar on the neck, and Arnold casually tells her she can touch it if she wants. Rich reaches out and runs her fingers over the scar, but Arnold suddenly grabs her hand, looking slightly annoyed. He remarks that if they were going to do this, he should have been wearing gloves so he could have defended himself. Rich blushes, explaining that touching her through gloves wouldn't make it right. Arnold whispers that he was just joking, but Rich continues to stare at him, her eyes shining with admiration. She finds Arnold to be sincere, and surprisingly considerate, contrasting with her own feelings of inadequacy. In an attempt to reassure him, she adjusts her dress, inviting him to touch her neck to make it fair. However, Arnold responds by stuffing her with a pillow. As they draw closer, Rich's expression turns mischievous, and Arnold says that her reaction is sufficient for his revenge. Arnold finds it curious that Rich has no qualms about sleeping beside him, yet making eye contact seems to unsettle her. Rich was hoping to help Arnold relax, knowing that his home shouldn't feel like a battlefield. Arnold agrees, expressing his desire for Rich to stay until he falls asleep, finding her presence far more comforting than an empty room. Unexpectedly, Rich ends up falling asleep with Arnold watching over her. Rich asks if Arnold was able to sleep, and he's surprised that this is the first thing she's asking, considering they slept next to each other. When they hear Oliver calling, Arnold covers Rich with a blanket and instructs her to remain quiet as he listens to a report from Oliver. Once the conversation is over, Rich returns to her own quarters. Her maid inform her that Rich received a gift from the area trading company and anticipates being very busy from then on. Next day, we see her disguised as a member of the Galkine Knights training squad, ready to report for duty. During her initial training, Rich, now using the name Lucius to fit in with the men, catches the eye of her superior for lagging behind the others. Later, we learn that the princess asked Theodore to join the training for knight candidates disguised as a man. Theodore finds this request odd and questions why his sister-in-law doesn't hire a private tutor instead. Rishi believes a private tutor might take it easy on her because she's a woman, so she wants to train rigorously alongside men. Initially, the prince declines to get involved, but then he realizes it's a chance to prank his brother by including his wife in the selection of knights. Rishi hesitates, knowing that even though it's unintended, Arnold will likely be very annoyed. However, she's made her choice, and Theodore agrees to let his sister-in-law join curious to see his brother's reaction to the plan. Back in the present moment, Rishi is resting, breathing heavily, surprised that this is just the basic training in Galkine. A guy named Fritz comes over and keeps her company during breaks since he would be alone at the inn anyway. Starting a chat, he mentions he's from a city called Asenia, a port town to the north where Coyle's ships dock. Fritz would have stayed there forever if it weren't for his admiration for Prince Arnold Hein, a war hero, inspiring him to become a knight and move to this kingdom. At that point, a Galkine count named Lawvine catches the young man's attention for not addressing the prince properly, and Fritz apologizes for the mistake. This noble is known to be the guardian of the north and very loyal to the imperial family. Despite Lawvine's good reputation, Rishi remembers that in three years, the future emperor Arnold will execute the count for a terrible crime. As she recalls this, she notices the count looking back at her, and she fears he might have realized she's disguised as Lucius. So, Lawvine asks if Rishi likes chicken, and in a deeper voice, she affirms. The Count then advises Lucius to eat more meat as he seems less muscular than the average man. Additionally, he says he'll join the training instructors starting tomorrow. Just then, a subordinate announces that the meeting with the Emperor is about to start. After that incident, Rishi takes off her disguise and heads back to the Imperial Mansion. She sneaks in through a window using a rope, then goes down the stairs where she meets her fiancé Arnold. He quietly tells her to meet him at the back gate on the west side the next day at 2 in the afternoon, ensuring nobody sees her. Rishi wonders if she should dye her hair to hide her identity, but Arnold dismisses the idea. Instead, she decides to wear regular city clothes to blend in. Later, Elsie asks what they were discussing, and Rishi explains that she's meeting the prince in the western part of the city, though she's unsure why. To keep a low profile, Elsie takes charge of making sure Rishi looks perfect for the meeting. Finally, when the time comes, Arnold asks Rishi to take off her hood since no one around knows her face. Despite Rishi's concerns that her plain attire might attract attention, Arnold insists it's the best option. Arnold doesn't mind the clothes and even plans to compliment Rishi's maid for her work. As they arrive at the famous Galkine Fair, Rishi becomes fascinated by Coquilto grapes and rare salu fags. Noticing Arnold's lack of enthusiasm, she adjusts her demeanor to appear more serious and comments on how fairs reflect the region's public order. She tries to impress Arnold with her diplomatic analysis, but he simply suggests exploring the fair and pulls out a pocket watch. Rishi buys a coil's fruit for Arnold, 
despite his reluctance due to its strange appearance. She insists it's nutritious, but Arnold's hesitant response makes her suspect he didn't actually enjoy it. Arnold then urges them to keep moving to avoid detection by Oliver's subordinates, who have just realized the prince is missing. Rishi asks Arnold if he doesn't have any official duties for the day. Arnold explains that they're going to a place where the owner doesn't visit the palace, so he needs to go there instead. When they arrive, an elderly couple greets them with gratitude for being hired by the prince. However, Arnold asks them to relax and not be so formal. The woman introduces herself as Mihaela Lorwerman, the owner of a small jewelry store. She playfully presents three stones to Rishi and challenges her to identify the fake one. Despite examining the stones closely, Rishi admits she can't tell which one is fake. Impressed by Rishi's honesty, Mihaela decides to use evaluation tools to try and stump her. After analyzing the stones, Rishi concludes that they're all fake due to their high transparency and well-cut facets. Mihaela is surprised by Rishi's keen observation and admits she's never had anyone ask for the evaluation tools before. Despite knowing their replicas, Rishi compliments the stones, saying they're still beautiful and would be cherished by anyone who owns them. Impressed by Rishi's humility, Mihaela expresses her admiration and offers to show her exclusive products. Arnold tells the jewelry store owner to let Rishi choose whatever she wants, which confuses Rishi because she thought they were there for Arnold's request. Arnold clarifies that he wants to give Rishi a ring during their wedding ceremony so Mihaela will prepare for it. Curious about the sudden decision, Rishi questions why Arnold didn't mention the ring earlier, as rings aren't customary in Galkai. Arnold explains that he didn't want to mention it earlier because Rishi might have refused due to its cost. He reassures her that by choosing the ring, they're also supporting the city's businesses and its people. Rishi promises to make a wise decision, considering the significance of the ring. With many options to choose from, Rishi wonders if a diamond would be suitable for a wedding or if an emerald would complement her eyes better. Mihaela advises her to choose a jewel that makes her feel confident, like a lucky charm. To help Rishi decide, Mihaela asks about her favorite color. Rishi gazes into Arnold's eyes, which she sees as crystal clear ice reflecting the cold country's landscape. She decides she wants jewels in the color of his eyes, though she acknowledges that this might sound strange to the sellers. She quickly clarifies that she simply finds his eye color beautiful. Miela finds the lady's behavior amusing and assures her she'll find a jewel in the desired color. Despite Rishi's attempts to explain further, she decides to drop the subject and asks Arnold to forget her previous comment. Back at the castle, Rishi admires Galkine's beautiful sunset, while Arnold questions why she chose to wear the ring on her left ring finger. Rishi explains that it's a tradition from her homeland. When Rishi asks why he decided to give her the ring, he admits there's no specific reason but thinks it's rewarding for her to see the gift from him while doing manual work. Rishi promises Arnold that he'll be the first to see her hand with the ring. Changing the topic, she mentions the arrival of Count Loewe. Arnold explains that the Count is highly qualified to train knight candidates. However, Rishi suspects that Arnold didn't bring such an important noble just to teach novices how to wield a sword. She presumes that Arnold is waiting for someone, considering how often he checked his pocket watch before returning to the castle. Arnold then reveals that he received a message from another country, stating the sender couldn't attend the wedding. So, he decided to advance the celebration on his own. Arnold tried to caution that this wasn't necessary, but another letter from the same sender insisted on advancing the meeting as soon as possible, without waiting for Arnold's response. As they were enjoying fruits recently arrived from Sealhose at the fair, Rishi speculated that the sender of the letter might have been on the same ship. Arnold confirmed this suspicion based on information from his patrol. Rishi was convinced it was Prince Kyle, a noble who had vowed to protect Galkine and was connected to one of the young woman's past lives. Later, Arnold welcomed Prince Kyle Morgan Cleveley to his palace, representing his father, the king, who conveyed congratulations on Arnold's wedding. While Arnold expressed gratitude for Kyle's presence, Rishi reflected on the vast differences between the two kingdoms. Coyle was prosperous, producing gemstones, gold, and silver but was often isolated by snow for a good part of the year, relying on trade with neighboring countries for food and essentials. Rishi also knew that in five years, Coyle would be destroyed by a war caused by Arnold. As Rishi was introduced to Kyle, he expressed his astonishment at her beauty, describing her as incredibly magnificent, like a beautiful, warm goddess. While Kyle continued to praise her, Rishi couldn't help but notice the paleness of his skin. When she glanced at Arnold's face, she noticed an expression of anger. After the meeting, Arnold discusses how Prince Kyle didn't reveal his true intentions upon arriving in their kingdom. Rishi asks what Arnold thinks those intentions might be, mentioning how she practically stared Kyle down with her gay. Arnold then reveals that he learned Kyle brought several scholars from Coyle, 
This triggers a memory in Rishi of when she treated Kyle in the freezing cold of the far north during her past life as a doctor. Another man was present during Kyle's treatment. Arnold then asks if Rishi wants to attend the next meetings with the noble from the neighboring country. She mentions having a medication that could help Kyle's frail health, which might make it unnecessary for him to drink anything Kyle offers. Rishi adds that it's just a joke, but Arnold isn't entirely convinced it's merely jest from her. He then informs her about a welcome banquet for Kyle the next day. Arnold plans to have Kyle face Count Lavine directly to keep an eye on him in case he's up to something. When Rishi learns that Lavine will be at the party, she can't help but show concern. Arnold notices her worried expression and asks what's wrong. Rishi brushes it off as nothing. But internally, she fears that Count Lavine might discover her secret identity as Lucius. At evening, Rishi was busy tending to her garden plot while worrying about maintaining her disguise in front of Count Lavine. She also stressed about ensuring Prince Kyle took his medicine on time, knowing his illness could worsen without proper treatment. While lost in her thoughts, Rishi noticed a man approaching and admiring her yard, assuming only someone skilled could maintain such a nice herb garden. To her surprise, she recognized him as Professor Michael, her former mentor from a past life. Recalling their adventures exploring the world together and discovering various substances, they watched the dawn, and Michael asked if it helped her research. Rishi confirmed it did and apologized for inconveniencing him. But Michael reassured her, saying he was always willing to help his former student. As they conversed, Rishi reminisced about the time she spent learning from Michael. When the guards intervened and asked Michael to identify himself, he introduced himself as Michael Haven from the Coils delegation. Despite the guards' offense at his informal address to the future Empress, Rishi stepped in to calm them down and took charge of the situation. She then reintroduced herself to Michael and asked if he was an academic, to which he agreed. Michael speculated about the techniques Rishi might use for her nails, showing interest in her method. Rishi explained her method of using lichen grass and gibberish nectar, along with albedo leaves, for her work. Michael suggested using karis leaves to avoid air bubbles, showing his thorough knowledge. He also recommended using stomata leaves to further strengthen the enamel. Impressed by Rishi's understanding, Michael offered to teach her more and asked if she wanted to be his student. Rishi eagerly accepted, happy to learn from her former mentor once again in this new life. As they discussed, Michael was curious about the plants in Rishi's garden and whether she intended to use them for medicinal purposes for Prince Kyle. This made everyone present a bit uneasy. Shortly after, Michael took Rishi to meet Prince Kyle. Kyle, feeling honored to meet the princess again, revealed that she was his highness's wife. This surprised Michael, who mentioned that Rishi had become his student unexpectedly. Learning about the herbal remedy Rishi was working on, Michael suggested it could help with Kyle's illness, although he admitted he didn't fully understand its composition and that Kyle might need to participate in an experiment. Rishi was concerned about how Kyle would react to the way Professor Michael presented the situation. However, Kyle didn't hesitate to accept the condition because his greatest desire was to cure the illness that had been bothering him for a long time, and he was willing to do whatever it took. Therefore, Rishi suggested finalizing the medication. She showed it to Kyle but warned him that it tasted extremely unpleasant. Michael reassured Kyle that he could handle it, and Kyle confirmed this himself. So the professor opened the lid and poured the formula into Kyle's mouth without diluting it with water first, much to Rishi's dismay. Watching Kyle struggle to swallow the substance, Michael asked what it tasted like, and Kyle described it as a bitter and sour mix with the smell of a horse stable. However, he added that as you swallowed it, it became sweeter, resembling a kind of mucus. Hearing this, Rishi told Kyle he didn't need to provide so much detail and promptly ordered some water for him. After that, Michael showed his research records, and Rishi was very excited about it. Once he had shown them to Prince Kyle, but the sovereign didn't understand anything written in the records, as if it were another language. So Michael was happy to meet someone who'd understand the knowledge he wanted to impart. This reaction from Rishi made the tutor realize how special that woman and then he asked her if she really didn't like the medicine she gave Kyle. At that moment, Rishi remembered her past life when Michael praised her talent but pointed out that her great flaw was using her abilities only to make others happy. Because no one should be able to determine another's happiness, since even suffering has its reason. For example, poison has the duty to fulfill this role. On the other hand, Rishi had questioned whether poison really can only bring suffering and commented that thinking someone is born only to bring misfortune doesn't really match her teacher. Anyway, Michael couldn't find anyone to try the medication they prepared, so until now, no one had tested this formula to see if it worked. Next, Arnold entered the room, calling Rishi to leave, and the princess explained that the man with her was Michael Heaven, an academic from Coyles who happened to become her teacher and would teach her many things while he was here. 
Upon hearing this, Michael stood up and introduced himself, and Arnold said that if he needed anything during this exchange of knowledge with the princess, he just had to ask. As she left with the prince, he asked his future wife if she always had the habit of staying out late, and she explained that she didn't notice the hours passing when she was very focused on work. But anyway, she had slept in the afternoon, so she was quite relaxed. Then the prince gave his future wife a valuable pocket watch, since such an item could be used in the elaboration of Babel strategies unlike what everyone thinks. Happy with the gift, Rishi realized that the crown prince was quite open to new technology, contrary to what she thought. And at that moment, she recalls once again a moment with Michael, where he lamented believing that no one would test this medication the way he wanted. As she snaps back to reality, Arnold asks why she's wearing that silly expression, but Rishi deflects and comments that, coincidentally, her former herbalism mentor and Renhua also found this item useful. Arnold inquires how this former mentor compares to her current professor. And Rishi notes that Michael is not a herbalist, though he knows some medicinal herbs that he uses in research. Ultimately, his job is to study all substances to create new ones like an alchemist. On the day of the party, Rishi prepares to act as naturally as possible so that Lavine doesn't uncover her disguise. While getting dressed, she receives a letter from Madame Majla, the owner of the store where her fiancé bought a ring for Rish. In the letter, Majla informs her that she managed to hire a craftsman from Kohl's who significantly accelerated the production of the ring, and upon seeing the project's design, the princess is delighted. During the party, Rishi notices the boredom on her fiancé's face. And at that moment, Kyle arrives at the event, feeling unworthy of such a ceremony. Once again, he praises the indescribable beauty of the haired princess of Galkin who asks how he's feeling today after taking the medicine. Kyle feels much better after medicating himself, and he's grateful to the princess, who soon bids farewell to talk with the other maiden. After a while, Rishi had fulfilled her basic duty of greeting everyone at the party, so she could focus on something she wanted to try for a long time. She concentrates as in meditation and turns the entire room black and white, with only Count Lalvi maintaining his colors in one corner of the party. Upon the success of her attempt, Rishi is surprised that her experience in the fifth life comes in handy at this moment. From then on, all she needed to do was to stay focused and not let anyone notice that she is avoiding Lavine. At a certain point in the party, she meets Lord Wildman, Mean and Mihela's son. He comments that Rishi visited his mother's store and people around, hearing the conversation, are impressed because Mihela once refused even the Empress as a client. Later, Rishi reveals that the delivery will be well before the deadline because of a craftsman and she wants to know to what extent this professional makes a difference in making the ring. Wildman explains that the craftsmen from Coils are exceptional, capable of working on detailed objects of various types, and that's why Rishi understands why they are known for jewelry and precious stones. Thus, while Rishi tries to keep away from the Count, Kyle gets down to business and asks for military support from the future Emperor of Galkheim because, as he well knows, Cole's military power is almost non-existent as it is a kingdom that relies on supplying precious stones and metals. Kyle fears that enemies will destroy Coils and then take Galkine, as they have already threatened to do, and that's why he desires an alliance between the two peoples to protect themselves from a potential attack. In turn, Arnold wondered when Prince Kyle would spill the beans and finally discovers what he came to do so far, even though he's unwell. Then he says that the value of a royal family is questionable when it doesn't recognize the importance of peace, and then wants to know what his kingdom gains from it. In exchange for the alliance, Cordels is willing to prioritize Galkai and the trade of precious stones, even if his kingdom doesn't profit from it. Watching the conversation, Rishi laments that Kyle is so direct to this point and doesn't know how to negotiate without giving away all the points. Arnold doesn't understand the reason for this condition because in Kyle's place, he would clearly place a validity clause in this contract so as not to be stuck in unprofitable business forever and jeopardize the financial health of an entire kingdom. Therefore, Arnold believes that Cole's mineral resources are almost depleted for the hair to make such a proposal. Finally, Kyle admits that his life won't last much longer, and a new hair to the crown is about to be born. Therefore, he wants to do everything he can to ensure Cole's future. Thus, he appeals to Kyle's reputation for reaching out to his people, and tries to convince him to do the same with his country's population. In the evening, Prince Kyle goes back to his room feeling down. He tells Mitchell he's feeling sad because he sees no hope. He recently found out that Arnold's true intention is to conquer and take over another country instead of forming an alliance. He gives Mitchell a sly look as he shares this news. Meanwhile, Mitchell is outside smoking and feeling pleased because he believes he has found the perfect person, Prince Arnold, to use poison effectively. The next day, Rich is training outside disguised as a soldier. She vents her frustrations about the thought of Coil being invaded, 
which marks the beginning of Arnold's terrifying rule. Count Lauvin approaches and praises her for training so early, but he senses hesitation in her. Rich confesses that she's afraid of a future where everyone in the country will have to go to war. The Count comforts Rich, saying it's normal to feel scared. He shares that his son bravely died in the last war, and although he's proud, he deeply wishes his son had survived. He understands that war takes away people's futures and allows others to steal them. To overcome this fear, he believes one must confront it and not ignore their own hopes and feelings. Instead, they should use them as motivation to keep moving forward. He encourages Rich to figure out what she can do herself. With determination in her eyes, Rich thanks the Count and agrees to follow his lead. Her determination is solidified. She doesn't want Coelis to be destroyed, but that's not the only thing on her mind. Remembering Arnold's harsh words from the other night when he crushed Prince Kyle's spirit, claiming himself to be better suited for conquest, Rich refuses to believe that her beloved could truly be that kind of person. Determined to confront him later during training, she is taken aback when Arnold unexpectedly shows up as their special observer. She wonders why it had to be him and why now. As Arnold stares at her, making her nervous, Rich hopes he might overlook her actions. However, Arnold's demeanor suggests otherwise. Slamming his hand against the wall, he questions her presence there. Trying to play it off, Rich greets him politely, but Arnold isn't fooled. He challenges her, asking if Lucius is truly the person he thinks he is, implying that he wouldn't mind testing Lucius's loyalty. The tense confrontation reminds Rich of a moment when she and Arnold had shared a kiss in the chapel, causing her cheeks to flush with embarrassment. She pleads with Arnold to stop, reminding him of his fiancé and the potential consequences if they are seen together. Arnold agrees with Lucius's statement, but he finds Lucius's manner of speaking disrespectful, especially considering Lucius is just a night candidate. Arnold decides to tease Rich about it, suggesting he wants to hear her apology directly from her. Rich concedes and apologizes for not informing Arnold about her decision to cross-dress and join the night candidate's training. After accepting her apology, Arnold advises Rich to rest and to keep her true identity a secret from everyone else. Rich happily agrees, expressing her enjoyment of the training regimen and praising Arnold's ideas for night preparation, despite her frustration with the looming prospect of war. She then reveals that she overheard Arnold's conversation with Prince Kyle. Arnold dismisses the idea of allying with Coyolas, believing it to be a nation in decline. He sees no value in forming an alliance with a weak country destined to collapse, and he contemplates the best way to expedite its downfall. Rich disagrees with Arnold's cold approach, but he brushes off her objections, stating that war is merely a political tool for the Empire. Later, in her room, Rich reminisces about her first encounters with Prince Kyle. She recalls how he treated people of different classes with respect and even supported her, and Michelle's medical research efforts. The following day, Rich met with Kyle to give him more medicine, which he took even though he knew it would taste bad. But during their meeting, Rich brought up something serious. She had heard Kyle and Arnold talking at a party, which made Kyle gasp because it was an embarrassing moment for him. Kyle knows that after failing to make an alliance with Arnold, the right thing to do would be to leave the country. But he feels like he can't give up. Rich worries about Kyle. Doesn't he know that Arnold personally executed members of other nations' royal family? Kyle is aware of this. However, after studying Arnold, Kyle believes that Arnold's harsh actions toward other countries might actually be a way to protect his own people. He thinks Arnold may have killed other monarchs to prevent future rebellions. He believes Arnold did this out of care for the people who were newly part of Galkine. Despite this understanding, Kyle refuses to give up. Rich was surprised when Kyle learned that she wanted to form an alliance. Later, she returns Kyle's research notes to Michelle. Based on Rich's interests, Michelle thinks she would be better suited as Kyle's apprentice rather than becoming Empress. However, Rich refuses Mitchell's suggestion because she's here to marry Prince Arnold, a name that catches Mitchell's interest. He admires both Arnold's rejection of Kyle's proposal and his reasons behind it. To Mitchell, the prince's fierce demeanor fits perfectly with the compound known as black powder, which deeply disturbs Rich. She tries to dissuade Mitchell, insisting that Arnold is actually kind-hearted. But Mitchell interrupts her, urging Rich to help him meet Arnold immediately. He is eager to meet him. Rich keeps making excuses, but Mitchell catches on. The truth is, she doesn't want Mitchell to meet Arnold. But how could she know about black powder if Mitchell hasn't explained it yet? Well, back in her third life, Rich had already begged Mitchell to stop his experiments, foreseeing the loss of many lives. Mitchell says, whatever humans create must be used in the right way. He always believed the biggest challenge was that no one could accurately define what the right way was. If the creation were to bring about the end of the world, he felt it wouldn't be wrong for him to want to witness it. This difference in philosophy is what led to their separation. 
In the hallway, Rich thinks about how to make Coyolas and Galkine friends and how to stop Michelle from meeting her prince. Suddenly, someone grabs her arm, making a loud clap sound. It's Theodore, looking serious. He heard that Arnold knows about Rich dressing as a boy, but he doesn't mind. He knows because he has people everywhere who tell him thanks. When Rich hears how good his informants are, she asks to borrow them. When she mentions they'll be used against Arnold, Theodore gets excited and agrees to help her. Meanwhile, Mitchell is outside, smoking as usual. He remembers his mother's grave and how his father blamed her death on him being born. His father said he was a curse to their family. Despite his tough days, Mitchell was always good at learning. Learning was like breathing or drinking water to him. In time, he gained access to an experimental lab where he learned a lot. Whenever he tried something new, it always worked out. Then a war happened, and everyone in the lab, including his father, died. He discovered a powerful substance, a black explosive powder, capable of causing massive destruction. He started to believe his father was right, that he brought bad luck to others. When Rich meets him, she questions if he plans to give Arnold the black powder. Mitchell responds that everything in the world has a purpose, and he believes he was born to shake things up. He feels he must fulfill this purpose, just as he told Rich in her previous life. But if things continue like this, she worries she won't be able to stop him. This bring an end to episode 10. Subscribe our channel for more of this anime next week. Till then don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Thanks for watching.